me fuel, give me fire, give me that which I desire. They set out to conquer the world. We had the songs, we had the attitude, we had the fire. We were determined to kick people's ass, and we did. And made their own rules along the way. Nobody's gonna f***ing sit down and tell me what Metallica is about or how it's supposed to be. From the heights of excess. Out of beer, pal. We were just getting as drunk as possible, as many girls as possible. Destroying dressing rooms, getting in fights, shooting guns off at hotels. We were pretty much inebriated 24 hours a day. To the brink of destruction. You're just sitting here being a complete f Well, these guys had all this buried tension and they just started boiling over. I was just left wondering, do we even have a band? And back on top again. Metallica is in a real good mood tonight. These are the stories of the world's most volatile band told by the people who live them. Every time we make two people happy, we pissed somebody else off. When we get in and play music, the world could be on fire. And we would be fine. Get on the train with us and hold on tight because we don't stop, we go hard. When Metallica ruled the world. In a world where only speed metal Soul. and hairspray was a crime, our heat were taken over and turned into headbangers. And so began a time of pure alcoholica, where only the Sandman, Rain, and Thrat was the name of the game. When Metallica ruled the world. Metallica just started out being basically James and Lars. James came from a very strict background and grew up in a suburb of Los Angeles, Downey, Norwalk area. My dad left at 13, and my mom passed on when I was 16. It's like, what's going on? Everyone's just leaving me. But the music was a huge, huge savior in my life. I moved from Denmark to Southern California in uh, August of 1980. I was 16 and sort of fooling myself into believing that I was going to follow in my father's footsteps. You know, be a professional tennis player. But within five minutes of being in L.A., it was all about the music in England. The new wave of British heavy metal was just starting to explode in England. You had bands like Iron Maiden getting recognized. Diamond Head, Angel Witch. Tigers of Pantang, Venom, full-on metal bands, <laughs> back when they were really metal. So I became kind of obsessed with all of it, and I, through the tennis racket, burned him probably, and kind of started fiddling with the drums. And he was always like, I'm going to start a band. We're like, yeah, sure you are, Lars. Well, I started advertising through the Recyclers Classified Ad newspaper in, in L.A. where you could sell your car or... <laughs> find a lead singer for your band. Every week that it would come out, looking under H, you know, for heavy metal, or M for metal, it was always him, and me, <laughs> maybe a few other people. You know, one day this guy named Hugh called up and said he was pretty into the metal stuff and he was gonna come along for a jam, and uh, he brought his friend James Hetfield along. You know, I went to his house and, whoa, man, there was a very interesting smell very Danish type of armpit smell. <laughs> James was incredibly shy and I mean, could hardly even make eye contact, but he seemed to at least have a passion for some of the same things that I was into. You know, his drumming was not amazing, but he had this drive. Hooking up with Lars was awesome, and uh, we bonded a lot in the music and in the drinking as well. We worked on this song called Hit the Lights. He played bass and guitar, I played the drums and he sang. The production wasn't good, but the song had attitude. Kind of just dirty and in your face. And we called the band Metallica and that was really the beginning of it. The next guy that came in the band was Dave Mustaine. Dave was an amazing guitar player. He could shred, I mean he was doing some amazing solos. He was the guy that could really play his instrument. None of the other guys really were that good, but Dave also liked to party a lot. He out-partied the rest of Metallica. It was San Francisco metal night at the Whiskey in L.A., and uh, me and James went down there. Say hi to the And we looked down on the stage, we heard this wild solo going on. 
there's this big mop of red hair going nuts, you know? And it was a wah sound. It's like, man, that guitar is heavy. And we look and we're counting the strings on it. Dude, that's a bass. Then this, this guy, Cliff Burton, and me and James had never seen anything like him. And we just looked at each other and said, we have to get this guy in our band. So we stuck around and we pulled him aside and said, you are amazing. We got to steal you. Basically, at the end of the day, he said, you know, I like you guys. Um, but you guys are gonna have to move up to San Francisco. Absolutely. We were ready to get out of LA. LA sucks! Even in 82, LA still was such a pansy ass environment for metal. Hair metal, big hair, glitzy outfits. Holly Crone Ratter talking about strippers and partying, getting laid on the Sunset Strip. <laughs> Metallica was completely different. They were street. It was just t-shirts, jeans, let's get down to business. Let's not screw around. Now why should we change while on stage? You know, we're not trying to be something big and fancy, you know? We didn't fit in with the music scene in L.A. We did up in San Francisco. I mean, in L.A., you get drinks with umbrellas in them. Up in San Francisco, it's, it's beer can. It was a much grittier atmosphere. So we went right up there instantly. San Francisco, would you please welcome? whole scene in San Francisco at the time was just waiting for a band like that to come up there and play. They liked the music, they liked the lyrics, and they didn't have to dress a certain way. Guys like me that were wearing like my Judas Priest denim jacket painted and my scarf. Metallica said, take that off. It's not metal. Just hang out. We made a demo tape, and I just sat there and sent it to 20 people. And then those 20 people, he'd send it to another 10 people. Somebody came into our store, Rock and Roll Heaven, in East Brunswick, New Jersey, and basically handed off a cassette for us to play. And the second we heard the first notes, we were blown away. Well, Johnny Z started a record company called Megaforce and basically called them up and said, hey, if you guys come to New York, uh, I'll do a record. So they were like, sure, let's do it. He paid for us to drive all the way out with our gear in a U-Haul trailer. He never even met us before. First thing we say to him is, hi, we're getting rid of our guitar player. On our way out to the East Coast, we were staying at Connections of Friends and Dave. He was trashing their houses and just really disrespecting stuff. And you know, we drank a lot. God, did we drink a lot. But Dave had sides to him when he was drunk that was not positive. I think especially Cliff thought that Dave Mustaine was just like out of his mind. It was going to bring us all down. And we had to put an end to it. If you ever wake up and the other three band members are sitting, you know, within two feet of you, staring at you as you're rubbing sleep out of your eyes, it's probably not a good sign. And that was what Dave awoke to that morning. We had the bus ticket in hand. Dude, we've got to let you go. Gave him 15 minutes to get his things together and then put him on a bus and then back to California. Probably not the nicest way to do it, but that's all we knew. So me and James got roaringly drunk about 10, 11 in the morning and went sightseeing. Start spreading the news. We went to the top of the Empire State Building and just started drinking. <laughs> and whatever that did for us, it, it, it helped. <laughs> that same night, Kirk Hammett came out from San Francisco, who was the lead guitar player of this band, Exodus. When I arrived, it was about, I don't know, I'd say 7 o'clock in the evening. These guys were just getting up. And I thought, wow, I, I like these guys. <laughs> he set up his gear. We played Seek and Destroy, and about halfway through Seek and Destroy, I remember me and James looked at each other and kind of just nodded, and, and we knew that it was the right thing. <laughs> They never really told me that I got the job or I was in the band, you know. I just kind of went along with the ride and all of a sudden I had about, I don't know, 10, 12 gigs un under my belt. Kurt, when he first came in, he looked like a guy that got, he was really shell-shocked. Within the first two or three weeks I was in the band, I found myself getting in between Mars and James. I can remember us just drinking and all of a sudden Mars and James getting into it. James pushed Lars and Lars fell into his drum kit. And Lars got up and started uh, running toward James and tackling him. And uh, me getting up and going, hey, whoa, here, guys, come on. 
But little did I know that that would be something I would be doing on numerous occasions over the next 20 years. We have a debut album out on Mega Force Records. It's called Kill Em All. What Metallica did in 1983 was they delivered an album that went where others didn't go. It was just so aggressive and so tough, and it's, you know, it's, you know, boys will be boys. No American band ever sounded like that. And you had all these underground kids that, all of a sudden when that record came out, it was like, this is our band. This is really our band. We had a very, very pure vision back then. Just four guys who just loved to play metal. We didn't think too much, we just did it. We were just living in the moment. We had the songs, we had the attitude, we had the fire. We were out to conquer the world. Coming up, Metallica drinks to success. Everyone was calling us Alcoholica. We were proud of that. We're living the rock and roll dream, and we can drink more than you. And later, they get filthy clean. We would tell our tour manager, when we go off stage, we want the showers running and girls in there ready and willing to bathe us. Next on When Metallica Ruled the World. In 1983, Metallica definitely were heroes of the underground. Kill Em All came out, and they went out and toured, and people saw how great they were live. We had about 35 dates with one of our favorite bands called Raven, and we went out and saw the United States for the first time. I really can't remember much of the Kill Em All for One tour, because we were pretty much uh, inebriated 24 hours a day. It was a bunch of 19-year-old kids who were basically given the carte blanche to just go out and rage and pillage. Destroying dressing rooms, getting in fights, uh, fighting each other. We didn't know anything about touring at all in those days, but we know one thing, don't take a Winnebago out and expect to ever return it. This poor Winnebago just died an ugly death. The trailer didn't have a top when it ended. It was probably the odor of all the alcohol that, that just killed everybody. It was crazy. <laughs> Everyone was calling us Alcoholica. We'd roll into town and, you know, I'd hear people screaming, Alcoholica! The name just stuck. <laughs> I'm gonna leave. We were proud of that. We're living the rock and roll dream and we can drink more than you. For the most part, the booze just fueled those first few shows and then started fueling those first few tours. We had to drink before we went on stage. Getting warmed up. I remember being fearful one night. Oh, I'm not drunk. What do you mean we're going on in 10 minutes? Oh, sh you know, trying to drink as much as possible. It's just crazy. I just want to say cheers to all you guys. And thanks for coming down and getting nutty with us, man. Cheers. I mean, it got to the point where someone gave me a live tape and I was like, oh my God, that's us. That doesn't even sound like us. We were out to drink and destroy. We'd come out of clubs at 7 in the morning. People are off on their way to work. We're jumping on the hoods of their cars at stop signs. Go to work. The kind of stuff that we were doing just probably shouldn't be talking about on family television. Shooting guns off at hotels, you know, in the middle of Hollywood. It also involved a lot of other things, like uh, partaking the odd uh, of females. Back then, bands like Metallica, you know, Anthrax, Slayer, the girls were kind of few and far between. And maybe it's because of what we look like. God, they're ugly. You know, it's a bunch of ugly guys. We look like we're 7-Eleven employees. They can f rock. In 1986 was when Master Puppets came out, and then they went out and did that Aussie tour. That was when they went from being a, a really amazing underground club band to being a band that could go out and play arenas. It was unbelievable to be sitting there with Aussie every night playing to 15,000 people. I'm there, Coliseum. The place was packed, looking around, and they all had 
Metallica shirts on. Everybody was headbanging, and somebody tore off the seat cushion off their seat, and they threw it at the stage. And so everybody started doing it. It looked like piranhas attacking a ham, you know what I mean? I've been to a, probably a couple hundred concerts, and this is the only concert I was ever scared at. And when it was time for them to leave to get off the stage, everybody kept chanting. This is the Ozzy concert, right? Like, Ozzy's definitely coming on. Yeah, they were blowing Ozzy off the stage. I mean, it, they were just a, a monster band. We were out to take over the heavy metal scene. We were just having fun. You never actually got a chance to think that there was anything else that could be. We were with Ozzy in the States till late May, and then Europe after that. We till next year, yeah, man. We're pretty much on the road. <laughs> It was a night like most of the rest of them on that tour. Play a show, hang out, drink, and, and stumble onto the bus. That night we were in Sweden. Uh, we were on our way to Denmark for a show. Me and Cliff were the last two people up. I went to bed before he did. The next thing that happened was, I just remember hearing these loud noises. It wasn't an earthquake, it was the back wheels of the bus jumping. The bus flipped and, and was rolling. And I thought, oh my God, we're going off a cliff or something. The bus, you know, went over on its side, you know, and I kicked out the back window, which is the emergency window. I don't know what it was, 15 degree weather outside. You know, we're all in our underwear. I just started freaking out. And I just knew instantly that uh, something was horribly wrong. I could hear everyone else screaming and crying, but I didn't hear Cliff's voice. It was all kind of odd because we were standing there going like, where's Cliff? And turn around, I could see, I could see Cliff's feet sticking out from underneath the bus. There's no movement, there's no nothing. And that was just something that I'll never forget. The vision is just, it, it's burnt into my mind. It took days and weeks to even, to even, to be able to just understand that that had gone down. You know, it's one of those things you relive over and over. You think so much about and you try and change it in your mind. It was so surreal because death and mortality, it, that was not part of the gig, you know what I mean? I felt like an orphan, you know? It felt like I had lost, you know, an older brother. It was so sad that he was taken at such a young age. Shortly after his funeral, we all decided Cliff would be the last one to say, you know, let's give up. That would pissed him off, you know, immensely. We had to keep going because it was the only thing we knew. We talked about it and we wanted to keep the spirit of Cliff Burton alive and well in Metallica. And to stop Metallica would to stop that, that spirit. Coming up. Metallica fills the void. This is the new f***er right here, Mr. Dixon, new kid on bass guitar. They hazed the hell out of that guy. It was far from easy. And later, group therapy. The higher we ascend, the more challenging it will be. We were all off in our own little childish worlds, so we needed that help. Next, on When Metallica Ruled the World. In the fall of 86, Cliff died. And as horrible of an experience of losing your best friend, um, there was no way the band wasn't going to go on. We always had, you know, fighting attitude, because we know Cliff would want it that way. We just jumped in and started auditioning, calling around, checking in with people like Brian Slagle. And I said, well, I think I have the guy for you, Jason Newstead. Of course, his favorite band in the world is Metallica. When I went in for my audition, I'm like, oh, holy crap. I know every song that they played and worshipped them and all that thing. He was incredibly talented. In the end, we just realized that Jason was the right guy. Eleven days after I was asked to be in Metallica, we were touring Japan. This is the new right here. Mr. Jason, new kid on bass guitar. It was like Cliff wasn't there, and it was tough. And the way that we coped with that was to take that out on Jason. They hazed the hell out of that guy. It's Jason's yeah. birthday today. Let's on. kill him. We would all 
always go drinking, all of us, without him. And then we would, of course, charge the whole evening's festivities to his room. We love you, Jason. <laughs> Honest. <laughs> We would tell him things like, you know that mini bar in your hotel room? It's all free, Jason, so let's drink it. And I didn't know that it cost money. Dude, they're in your room, you know? We weren't very nice at all. Hey! Hey, let's go! No matter if this band goes for 20 more years, you know, I'm always going to be the new guy no matter what. With the release of Angels for All in 89, and Metallica finally made a decision to make a video. <laughs> Here's Metallica with their first video ever. This is called One. At that time, videos on MTV were all just kind of cheesy and corny. Now that the war is through with me. We were more into portraying ourselves in a different light. Television had the power to show the people what Metallica looked like and sounded like and make it almost a household name. When the one video came out, it exposed millions of new people to Metallica. They were on the brink of, if you haven't heard of us, guess what? You will. Me and James wrote what became the Black Album in probably about three months or so over the summer of 1990. It was a constant battle between Lars and I. Do you want to hear it with vocals? I Go sing it. One verse and one chorus. All I have. You know, we'd be fighting over ridiculous things that didn't matter. We'll fight for hours over it. The vocal line goes exactly with the guitar. But the, the conflict and just the static created this electricity that uh, we were hitting a new peak in everything. When that album started taking shape, it was just like one great song after another. From a production and songwriting point of view, it was a departure from all the albums they had done songs that were a bit different, a bit more melodic, a little more personal. It was an amazing record, and it kind of had the feeling of keeping their old fans happy, but also kind of crossing the boundaries into new stuff. Black Album was released in August of 1991. The metal world was lined up in the streets in the middle of the morning, waiting for a record store to open. The Black Album came out, debuted number one, and it was just a combination of, you know, an amazing album, the right time, the planets just all aligned themselves properly. You guys expecting your album to do what it did? Or are you no. blown away? No. Actually, I was expecting it to do a lot better. <laughs> Every month I'd get a phone call, yeah, we just passed the four million mark, and a month later the five million mark, a month later the six million mark, and the record just kept going and going. After like the third or fourth single, I just thought, when's it gonna stop? But it never really stopped. It was craziness. That was really the time where you thought, okay, this band is the biggest band in the world. Because everywhere you went, you heard Metallica. We were just totally saturating airwaves. 40 minute music marathon, enter Sandman from Metallica. If it wasn't the airwaves, it was, you know, the TV waves. <laughs> <laughs> if it wasn't the TV waves, it was like the media. We were on front covers of magazines and it was just everywhere. You had people in Russia, you had people in China. There's people on satellites jamming to Metallica. Remember one time, dude sends a video. It comes on the screen and you're inside the cockpit of a spacecraft. You see these dudes come floating into the picture, right? And you hear music come on and it's Metallica. And he takes his hands and his hands come up and he's got Dan Justice in one hand and he's got the black album and he goes... I love them. They're, they're my favorite band. We started noticing that there would be many more females showing up at the gigs. A lot of f chicks. It looks like 50-50. That's the sign of making it. We got to a point where we would tell our tour manager, when we go off stage, we want you guys to have 
the shower's running and girls in there ready and willing to bathe us. They became known as tub tarts. The guys on the crew would go out and ask young willing females if they're, they're you know, willing. The opening line would be, would you mind getting your hair wet? We'd get off stage, hop in the shower, and voila, there'd be like, you know, a girl in there, sometimes two, sometimes 14. Whoever was in the shower last I would get the not so good looking ones, you know. I'd be lying to you if I said it wasn't pretty fun. Might sound stupid, but uh, how many in here don't have the new album? The Black Album was giant, and we went everywhere and anywhere. We were on the road for two years, and I think did someone in the city of about 250 shows. The band set out to play every market that they possibly could, and that, and that was worldwide. Moscow, we having some fun today! You know, we'd finish a leg on the tour, and then I remember our manager would come out, hey guys, guess what? We gotta go back to Japan. The Wherever I May Roam single has gone through the sushi house roof or something, you know. It's, it's, we gotta go back there. When a record's got those kind of legs on it, you gotta go out there and, and just try and, and hold on. We were out on tour one evening in August 92 in Montreal. We go out there and play our set. Everything's fine, you know, the audience is, is grooving. During Song Fade to Black, I moved for some reason. I was right over a canister that would shoot up a 12-foot chemical flame. I just want to do that. All the strings melted off the guitar instantly. I mean, it was the most horrific pain. I was like, holy f I can't believe it. I can't believe this is happening. Half my hair was gone. Half my mustache and beard was gone. Half my skin on my arm was gone. I can visibly see the skin rising off the back of his hand. Once we got to the emergency room, James was already talking about how we could continue the tour. The Metallica attitude is, okay, that happened, but that's not going to stop me from doing this. James would not be able to play guitar for quite a while, but he could continue singing. So we got another guitar player, and we were up and running again within like, you know, two and a half weeks. Bang, they came right back. Dun, 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 dun. Metallica. you know, some other band. It was far from easy, but we were determined to kick people's ass, and we did. We knew that that ride was only gonna come by once, so we grabbed it and definitely had fun with it. You get one chance for a phenomenon, and that was our phenomenon. Coming up, Metallica falls apart. He left the band! Man. Next on When Metallica Ruled the World. After the Black Album Tour, almost three years, I could not believe that it was over. We'll see you around soon, I hope. Thanks very much. Good night from me, Metallica. They're the biggest band in the world. Everybody loves them. So they're like, wait, we're not used to this situation. we got to do something to kind of shake things up and do something different. Load came out in 1996. It was a risk both in the way they looked and the way they sounded. Just like the curse, just like the stray. The people expected Black Album 2 were shocked, disappointed, and distraught. It was the new Metallica. Bam. Sort of like we have short hair now, and we kind of dress like we work at funeral homes, and we drank martinis, but now we play songs that are kind of bluesy. 
I kind of wish I was like really close friends hanging out. Like, dude, um, love everything. But listen, you don't need the eyeliner. You know, we got arrested by the heavy metal police. Pull over, you know. You're not metal anymore. Look at you. It seemed to really affect people, and I really don't know why. At that time, that felt right. Nobody's gonna f sit down and tell me what Metallica is about or how it's supposed to be. <laughs> We were in the studio working on a track for Mission Impossible 2, and all of a sudden we found out that it was available on Napster. We got online and checked it out and started to see the volume of songs that were being traded and started to realize that this is something that's beyond our control. We controlled Metallica. So it was these let's go after them. Hi, I'm Kurt Loder with MTV News. Napster, the controversial music swapping website, got a very special delivery on Wednesday when Metallica drummer Lars Ulrich showed up at the company's headquarters in San Mateo, California. On um, April 14th, Metallica filed a lawsuit against Napster for um, basically encouraging people to steal and trade our music. Suing Napster from a publicity standpoint was probably the biggest misstep in Metallica's career. I think it's about the most unhip thing that I've ever seen a big rock star do. How much money does Metallica already have? Do they really need more money? I used to like Metallica a lot, but the fact that they're doing this, I'm really upset about it. All of a sudden, we were just like anti-music fan because we were anti-Napster. You know, we were the bad guys. We were these greedy rock stars. People branded us that. Lars, for all the flack he took in the beginning, he was right. Sure enough, it, it has become a big problem. But at the time, they certainly were public enemy number one. It was just one more thing that was kind of looking bad for Metallica at the time. By the summer of 2000, there was a lot of tension within the band between the three guys and Jason. Calm down. I'm trying to. Are you stressed out? Just a little bit. It kind of felt like it built up over the last 14 years. Really, ever since he came in the band, he was always battling for position. There was some stuff that wasn't dealt with when Cliff passed away that made Jason definitely the outsider. Jason wasn't getting a lot of his music in Metallica, and so he wanted to do side projects. Echo Brain was actually uh, one of the projects that I had ongoing, and we started getting kind of serious, and we started playing more and more together. James saw it as a betrayal. He just freaked out. Man, that was such a sore subject. And, you know, I dragged Lars into it saying, hey, we can't let Jason go off and do this stuff. Echo Brain's music was so different than Metallica's music. I couldn't fathom how it would change the fan base of Metallica in any negative way. We were on separate pages. I mean, completely separate ideas on what was going on. So we called a band meeting. We all got together in this hotel room and Jason just dropped the bomb right off the bat. I'm gonna ask James straight up, dude, you can't be in a band with me if I do Echo Brain, right? He says yes. I said, then I have to go. And I am leaving the band. I don't think you can properly weigh the magnitude that his departure had on Metallica. And when he left, it shook them to the core. He left the band, period. He left the band. One good thing came out of that. That was when we hooked up with Phil Toll. The more we feel good about ourselves and each other, and the higher we ascend, the more challenging it will be. Phil is a performance enhancement coach that we thought could be of some help to Metallica. I don't want to end up like Jason, okay? I don't want to be pushed away. We were all off in our own little childish worlds, so we needed that help. We're here, and the camera's here, and my friend the Boom is here. <laughs> you want to play music? Yeah. The band was going into the studio for the first time in five years, and Bruce Stanofsky and I were hired by the record company to do maybe five minutes of promo footage. And as soon as we arrived, the uh, hit the fan, and they're having therapy. To me, it's not going to be a matter of whether the cameras are in play, but whether or not you guys are free enough to risk being seen by other people. Metallica to keep the cameras rolling and whatever it becomes, it becomes. You're just sitting here being a complete 
I was straight up with you and I told you I'm in a mood and what have you been doing? Picking at me all night. Well, these guys had all this buried tension that they hadn't talked about for 20 years and they just started boiling over. You know, all you want to do is pick a fight and I don't want to pick a fight. Come on, guys. We have better things to do. Yeah, I do. I do. Metallica frontman James Hetfield has entered a rehabilitation facility to undergo treatment for alcoholism and other undisclosed addictions. My behavior on the road showed up at home, and my wife put an end to it. She said, you're not a good influence on our children, and you're certainly not the person I'd like to be around. And she threw me out of the house. There was no other choice than to check in somewhere. When James told me that he was going off to rehab, the first thing I thought was, well, I'm not surprised. <laughs> I mean, it was only a matter of time before any one of us checked into rehab. James went away in June of 2001 and said that I'll be back in five weeks. Which turned into eight more weeks, which turned into a few more months, which, you know, turned into a few more months. It was a bit of a sandwich, though. What is it? The unraveling of a band? <laughs> and then there were two? <laughs> I was just left wondering, you know, what's going on? Do, I mean, do we even have a band? I'm prepared for the worst. Coming up, Metallica faces extinction. I didn't even know if I was going to be in the band anymore. We started thinking, well, is he ever going to, like, figure it out? Next, on When Metallica Ruled the World. entire period where James was in rehab, Metallica looked like it was falling apart. The longer James chooses to stay away from dealing with us, the further we drift apart. He was away for months and months and months. Even by the time he came back to San Francisco, he was still doing his own thing. I had to step up and take care of myself. My life was filled with other things. Connecting with family again, trying to save my marriage, seeing my kids. I didn't even know if I was going to be in the band anymore. We started thinking, well, is he ever going to, like, figure it out? It took a lot of thinking. What's going on in my head now? Where am I at? What do I need in my life? A lot of stuff. Eventually, he did tell us that he was ready. Anyway, here we are. Play a riff. It's probably the best sound I've ever heard in my life was the fact that you were playing guitar in here. It was just great to have him there, to know that it's not going to end. Having the support from band, it was just amazing. It was like being born again. We really had to go through all those bad, dark times to get back to the good times. The big machine started rolling again. And they kind of swung back into Metalla World. The album St. Anger made a lot of sense. It spoke so much of my heart and of everyone else's heart in the band. We've proven that you can make aggressive music without negative energy. Towards the end of the San Anchor side, we realized, okay, now we have to get a bass player because now we have to take this elsewhere. So we started auditioning. I thought that it would be really, really great if I at least got an opportunity to jam with the guys. So when I received that phone call, you know, I, I was pretty excited. I could, uh, uh truck battery. <laughs> It was so evident that he was the guy for us. And looked over at him during whiplash. He was just right in the pocket and in there. It hadn't been played that way since Cliff. 
we wanted to send a message that he would start out immediately as an equal. To show you how serious we are about this, offer you a million dollars uh, to join our band right now. Oof. <laughs> I can't really talk right now. <laughs> I was pretty much in shock. For a second, I, I thought they were joking. It was them saying, we're going to do this different. We're going to do this right. We're not going to make the same mistakes that we've made with Jason. And to walk into that environment and to have it be sort of a clean slate was amazing. The one thing about Metallica over the years is they've never been afraid to do something different and take chances. And I think with some kind of monster, they took a big chance. It started out as a five-minute promo film, and it just transformed into something really raw, real, and honest. When I was running this morning, I was thinking about seeing this and the word comes up so much. Some kind of monster. That's so The hugest chapter in my life. It was just like everything else Metallica's done in their career. It's a ballsy move. They don't let the outside world sway them. They do what they want to do, and they always find a way to get back on top. When St. Anger came out in June of 2003, it hit number one in 30 countries. When it did debut at number one, that is a good feeling that, man, you could put your heart out there no matter how black it is, and people can understand it. It felt like all the blood, sweat, and tears that we shed for this band to try to turn it back into a functional, creative entity actually paid off. From the minute they took the stage for the first time, they felt that they had overcome so much that they truly felt bulletproof. Metallica is in a real good mood tonight. Metallica is in better shape than it's ever been before. And when you've been doing something like this for 23 years, that's a pretty big statement. It seemed for a long time like we would never really make it to this point. All right. But we're still here, we're still kicking ass. Get on the train with us and hold on tight because we don't stop, we go hard. We still rule the world.